Hi everyone. So today I'm going to be talking to you about um, robo psychology and other careers that don't exist yet. In Isaac Asimov's stories, the technical, social and personal impacts of advanced robotics and artificial intelligence are explored. One creation in his books was the career of robot psychologist, a combination of mathematician, programmer and shrink that diagnose and treat misbehaving AI. In this talk, we're going to discuss how on earth you can prepare for a career in robo psychology and other careers that just simply don't exist yet. Isaac Asimov is primarily known for being one of the most prolific and impactful science fiction writers ever. And as you would expect, while wandering around these fictional worlds, he came up with a few sciencey sounding mumbo jumbo terms such as positronic and psychohistory. And he's literally the father of the word robotics. He first used the term in his 1941 story, Liar, about a robot called Herbie that develops telepathic abilities and can read people's thoughts. However, because the robot's core operating principles, or programming, still included the first law of robotics, that is, not to hurt people, Herbie starts lying to people to make them feel happy. This leads to Herbie leading a robo-psychologist called Susan Calvin to believe that a co-worker fancies her. And when she finds out that this isn't true and Herbie just told her this because Herbie knew that the idea would make her feel better, she was very hurt. This first law is part of Asimov's three laws of robotics, which were officially codified the following year in 1942 as a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must comply or must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protections do not conflict with the first or second law. These simple laws that were programmed into all robots uh, collided with the very human tendencies of wanting to be loved and cared for and created this imaginary field of research called robo-psychology. This is a field of research that today doesn't really exist, but I first read about it in 2014 whenever I was on a packed commuter train in California having just left Google's Mountain View complex where I'd met a university friend who was a programmer there. I'd spent the previous five years in a master's program at Queen's University Belfast studying electronics and software engineering, a course that's now called Software and Electronic Systems Engineering, and I would highly recommend it. So if you're interested, ask me afterwards. It focused on the overlap between two fields that in my eyes were obviously part of one bigger field. The electrical engineering side, how do you put lightning into glass to make it add numbers together? And then the computer science side, how do you take that act of adding numbers together and trick it into making into imagining that it's thinking? The physical world of computation and the virtual world of programming and the magic in between fascinated me. I wasn't a particularly stellar student. Uh, I, I asked lots of awkward questions and never did particularly well in exams. Uh, but I just kind of resigned myself to going down the standard engineering pathway. The get degree, join big company, write banking software for 30 years, retire. But my discovery of this weird term, robo-psychology, kind of kicked me in the behind. Um, after that, I gave up on the prospective banking analyst job and took up a uh, postgraduate research exploring how smart submarines could collaborate and interact with each other for environmental and predominantly military applications, including how do you hide a nuclear submarine using sound and how do you use atomic clocks to build underwater GPS systems, as well as doing all of this under the assumption that somebody can take control of one or more of your submarines and make it lie or behave badly. The research eventually became too classified for me to continue to work on, but I know that I contributed to international agreements on how autonomous systems are allowed to integrate into military chains of command. I'll never know whether this actually matters, but we'll find out. But anyway, this interplay between how fixed, rule-based, programmed systems like computers and robots and the fuzzy, fluffy, mushy stuff that comes from people and communities has more or less driven my career since then. 
I spent two years developing smartwatch applications that could tell how stressed you were, culminating in, in, in culminating in partic developing particularly shameful lie detecting underwear, as well as a survey system for a deodorant manufacturer that only asked you questions about the product when it knew that you were sweating. Um, we also developed a universal emotional translator based on some research where we literally threw people down mountains on motorbikes and worked out how stressed they were. After that, I leapt, in, leapt back into my old alma mater of cybersecurity, developing smart algorithms that watched the world's internet traffic, sniffing out hackers, trying to predict their next moves and detect the faint, faintest wisps of exploration and exploitation, fully aware that the hackers were doing exactly the same thing on the other side, automating intelligence gathering and teaching that lightning how to think um, and how to think for them. In my current world role, I lead a team of data scientists, a term that didn't really exist when I was on that train in California only six years ago. We develop and monitor intelligence systems that watch company websites for security vulnerabilities. My day job is to work out better ways to try and pretend to be a hacker and work out how to automate the boring bits of the professional white hat hackers that I work with. When I was your age, these jobs just didn't exist. The internet as we know it today didn't exist. We didn't know what we didn't know. So when my careers teacher told me in around 2004 that I should look at being an insurance adjuster because I was good with numbers, she didn't know that the job would effectively be automated out of existence. So I ended up being a data scientist, not because it's what my careers teacher or parents or friends told me, and it, it, it's not because it's on some skills or employability map or because the output of some assessment, assessment tests. The job role didn't exist. And I guarantee you that most of you watching now will end up working in and creating jobs that simply don't exist today. This could be bit farming or crypto influencer or quantum annealer or indeed robo psychiatrist. So as you go through your studies, don't allow yourself to fixate or judge yourself against what jobs are out there now. Your parents and your teachers and your friends genuinely want what's best for you. So they will suggest and encourage you to follow certain paths, generally because it's advice they wish they could give themselves 20 years ago based on their own experiences since then. But the thing is that the past 20 years was theirs. The next 20 years is yours. There are no robo-psychiatrist jobs out there, yet. Build your own paths and experiences. Read widely, care deeply, and don't be afraid of being directionless or meandering. Because if you make your own luck, you might just end up in the right place at the right time with the right skills to realize that you're being lied to by a telepathic robot. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions either online or just randomly. Also, I'll be hiring for the next few years, so if you think my line of work sounds fun, give me a shout.